So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Andrew Childs to our Cambridge Warwick uh, Economic Competition Colloquium. Uh, Andrew, he obtained his PhD <clears throat> uh, from MIT, where his advisor was uh, Eddie Fari. And now Andrew is uh, serving as a professor of uh, in the Department of Computer Science and the Institute for Advanced uh, Quantum uh, computer, uh, Advanced Computer Studies at the University of Maryland. He's also a joint director of a new initiative called Qu NSF Quantum Leap Challenge Institute for robust quantum simulation. So today, uh, Andrew will uh, tell us about some remarkable work uh, about uh, that uh, essentially presents a quantum version of one of the most uh, widespread computer science primitive, divide, divide and Conquer. So Andrew, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for um, you know the opportunity to, to tell you about this work. And um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I hope you'll find it interesting. So, so I'd like to tell you about this, um, this result on, um, you know, indeed a, a framework for divide and conquer algorithms for quantum computers, uh, you know, a sort of way to get upper bounds on quantum query complexity following um, an idea that's very analogous to um, the kind of divide and conquer algorithms that are sort of bread and butter and introductory, uh, you know, uh, classical algorithms courses. Uh, so this is a joint work that I did together with some fantastic collaborators. So uh, Robin Katari, who uh, I guess was at Microsoft when we did the work, but he's uh, actually now at Google, uh, Matt Kovashik, uh, here at Maryland, Arthi Sundaram, who's at Microsoft, and Dachin Wong, who um, actually just yesterday uh, defended his PhD dissertation uh, here at the University of Maryland. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, learning more about this work, there's a paper that you can find in the archive. Um, there's a the archive number is here, but you can you know I'm sure you can search for it online. Okay, so um, the kind of general question that um, you know I'm really interested in, and that this talk is about, um, you know, has to do with the power of quantum computers. So, what are what are quantum computers good at? You know, how can we use them to solve problems faster than classical computers? Right. So, you probably know that um, if we sort of design things in the right way, and if the problem that we're looking at has the right kind of structure to take advantage of this capability, um, you know, then there are some problems that we can solve a lot faster using quantum computers than using classical ones, you know, by somehow exploiting the possibility of having interference among a lot of different computational paths, right? So that's kind of the, the um, idea that, that, you know, got people excited about this, this concept of quantum computing. Um, so there's a variety of different kinds of quantum speedups that we see in, in quantum algorithms. Um, you know, some, for some problems, we can get exponential or at least super polynomial speedup over, um, you know, the best classical algorithms that we know, or in some cases, you know, depending on the model that we're looking at, maybe we can, can even prove that we have such a significant speedup. And there's a, you know, um, I don't know if I would say long, but there's a there's a substantial list of problems that have this kind of uh, quantum speed up, or where we think there's this kind of quantum speed up, and you know hopefully this list continues to grow. Um, and then there's a lot of other problems for uh, you know probably a whole longer list of problems for which we have not exponential quantum speed up, but polynomial quantum speed up, where we can get some advantage that's you know not not as significant as uh, you know an exponential speed up, but still uh, you know something like a quadratic, or you know in some cases a bit less, or maybe in some cases a bit more than quadratic speed up. Um, you know, which is still something that you know potentially if we could build a really uh, you know robust and and um, you know kind of uh, scalable quantum computer could be something that would would still provide a, a meaningful advantage over uh, you know what we can do with classical computers. Although of course you would need to build a much uh, sort of better, uh, you know, quantum computer to take advantage of these smaller quantum speedups. Uh, anyway, the um, you know whereas probably Shor's factoring algorithm is maybe the best known example of a, a problem uh, or of a quantum algorithm that provides super polynomial quantum speedup. You know, Grover's algorithm is maybe the best example of uh, or the best known example of a, a quantum algorithm providing polynomial quantum speedup. But there's many other examples of problems, you know, in, in both of these two uh, kind of categories. So this is the basic question that we're interested in addressing. You know, what are the problems that we can solve a lot faster using quantum computers uh, than with classical ones? Um, and you know, how can we how can we sort of um, uh, you know when we when we see new problems, how can we understand whether those are problems for which we can get some quantum speed up, and if so, how much? Uh, and you know, so these speed ups really depend on exploiting particular structures of particular kinds of problems. Um, and so there's sort of a lot of work to be done to understand, uh, you know, what kinds of quantum speed ups we can expect and and ultimately achieve. Okay, so, and I would say one of the challenges in trying to have, you know, fast quantum algorithms is that, uh, you know, we have a somewhat limited toolbox for developing them, right? So there are a bunch 
bunch of tools that have been applied to develop quantum algorithms and find these quantum speedups, you know, including things like, you know, Fourier sampling, which goes into, you know, that's kind of the heart of this, of this factoring algorithm. There's this idea of, um, you know, uh, the, the Grover search algorithm, or more generally, the concept of amplitude amplification that's used in a lot of different quantum algorithms uh, that achieve polynomial quantum speed up. And there's a bunch of other, you know, tools that have been developed um, to, to, you know, produce quantum algorithms with, with speed up over classical computing. Um, but the list is ultimately not that long. You know, there is sort of a lot more work that's gone into the development of classical algorithms over, uh, you know, a, a larger number of years. So there's a lot less that's known about um, you know, what we can do in the quantum setting than in the classical setting. And so this talk is, I would say, you know, even more so than an attempt to, to identify um, specific new quantum speedups, you know, it's really about an attempt to develop a new tool that can be used um, to find quantum speedups more generally. And, and so what we would like to do is we would like to, you know, fill up this toolbox so we have more at our disposal when we try to, um, you know, design quantum algorithms for problems. Okay, so the specific tool that we're going to develop has to do with this notion of divide and conquer, and this is, um, you know, really kind of a core idea in in classical algorithms that you know, um, you know, uh, comes up all over the place. Actually, this semester I'm teaching an undergraduate course on classical algorithms. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go teach it. Uh, you know, this afternoon. And uh, one of the things that actually we've already talked about in the course is this notion of divide and conquer algorithms. So it's really kind of like a standard thing that's covered in, um, you know, kind of um, the basic kind of algorithm sequence that, you know, undergraduate students take. Um, so, but in case you're not familiar with this idea, let me just kind of briefly uh, introduce it and talk about a kind of, a, um, uh, you know, kind of standard example of a classical divide and conquer algorithm. So the general idea is that we've got some problem we want to solve. We're going to divide it into subproblems. Then we're going to solve those subproblems in some way, um, and the way we're going to solve them is, you know, using recursion. So the algorithm we're going to apply is the algorithm that we're now describing. You know, kind of until we get down to some base case that can just be solved trivially. The way we solve these subproblems is just to call the algorithm that we're now describing. Um, and then what we're going to do once we've solved, you know, once we've recursively solved these subproblems, is we're going to combine the solutions to solve the full problem. And when we do that, we might have to do some additional computation. So the answer might you know, in, in general, won't be just, you know, immediately clear from the um, the work that we've done by solving the subproblems. We may have to do some additional work uh, to put those solutions together. Okay, so the, the kind of canonical example of a classical divide and uh, conquer algorithm is the merge sort algorithm that maybe you're familiar with. So let me just, you know, briefly remind you how this goes. So imagine that we have some list that we want to sort. Um, and so what we're going to do is first, we're going to divide that list in half. So we're going to divide it into a left half and a right half. And now we're going to sort the two halves. So we're going to do that recursively. I'm not going to sort of go through all the recursion. I'm just going to imagine we sort the left half and we also sort the right half. So we do that. And now the kind of key observation is that once you have these two halves and you've sorted them, then producing the full sorted list um, is pretty easy. You just have to merge these two lists and you can do that with one you know, pass through the two lists. Kind of, you know, it just takes linear time to go through these two lists. You just kind of keep pointers to locations in these two lists and you keep taking the element which should go next in the overall list, right? So this is something you can do in time linear in the length of the list to go from these two lists that are themselves individually sorted to one list that is globally sorted, right? So that's, that's the idea of merge sort. And um, you can easily write down a recurrence for the cost of running this algorithm, right? So the cost um, uh, for doing this on an instance of size n is twice the cost of doing it on an instance of half the size. So that's the cost of you know uh, recursively sorting the two halves. And then you do a linear amount of work um, to uh, you know merge the two lists, right? And now you can solve this recurrence, you know, using uh, the, the master theorem or you know whatever technique you like to solve this recurrence. And what you find is that the cost of sorting the um, you know the cost of running this overall algorithm uh, is like n log n. Right. And this is so this is sort of like the best, you know, kind of complexity you can hope for for kind of a, you know, comparison based sorting algorithm. So this is really, um, uh, you know, sort of showing that merge sort is, you know, a, a very fast uh, sorting algorithm. OK, but we sort of got this, you know, just by thinking, you know, in terms of this, uh, you know, split into these non overlapping sub problems and then finding a way to combine the solutions of the, um, you, you know, the two sub problems, the sorted lists for the two halves in order to get the overall sorted list.
right? So this is an idea that appears, you know, in many different forms in, you know, a lot of different classical algorithms. You know, sometimes things can be much more complicated than this in terms of the way you merge or, you know, various various uh, kind of features of the algorithm. But this kind of core idea is one that, you know, is quite um, quite fruitful in a classical algorithm context. So what we would like to do now is we would like to somehow come up with um, a way of designing quantum algorithms that use this idea and that, um, you know, achieve quantum speed up over what we can do classically in some cases. So that's what we're going to see how to do. Okay, so um, let me describe an example that's actually maybe an even simpler example than this kind of sorting problem, um, where we can where we can sort of think about how we might divide and conquer in a um, quantum context and get some speed up, just as kind of a motivating example. Okay, so the simple example we're going to look at is actually this kind of like unstructured search problem where we know there's a quadratic quantum speed up. You know, this is the problem of computing the OR of an input string that's given to us by a black box. So we have some string X with bits X1 through Xn, and our goal is to compute the logical OR of all of those bits. In other words, to figure out whether there's a one in the input string. Okay, so um, I mean, we know how to solve this quantumly, you know, and sort of classically in an optimal way, but let's try to think about how to do it in a kind of divide and conquer way. All right, so um, a way to think about trying to, to divide and conquer for this for this problem might be to divide up this this um, you know string of n bits into a left half, so like the first n over two bits, and a right half, you know, the last n over two bits, and then to compute the OR of the left half and the OR of the right half, and then in this case the kind of the work to merge the solutions, you know, to kind of get the answer, um, you know, once we have these two things. It's quite easy, right? We just have to compute the OR of, of the OR of the left half and the OR of the right half uh, with no additional queries. So if we're just counting query complexity, there's kind of no additional work. Um, and uh, you know that's a very, very natural kind of way of solving this problem by divide and conquer. And you know, the classical recurrence for this is um, you know, quite straightforward, right? So the cost, it, let's let's think about a recurrence for the query complexity. So we're just going to count queries to the input. Um, and so the classical, you know, query complexity for this instance of size n is, you know, at most, I mean, uh, you know, for, for this algorithm is, is equal to, but if we just think about this as a particular upper bound, you know, the, the complexity is at most twice the cost of solving an instance of half the size. Okay. And that's a really easy recurrence to solve, right? The, um, what this tells us is that the cost is at most n. Right, which is not surprising, right? We know you can answer the question by like querying all of the bits. So we know uh, already that the cost is at most n and sort of that's what's achieved by this algorithm, which is, I mean, it's kind of unsurprising because like for this problem classically, you can't do any better than that. So somehow this is what has to come out. Okay, But you can get it by solving this recurrence. Okay, so now what we would like to imagine is that somehow we could think about the quantum speed up, you know, as, as arising from some kind of quantum version of this recurrence. So a way that that could happen might be that somehow that the quantum cost for solving this instance of size n could be at most the square root of two times the cost of solving an instance of half the size, right? So if this were the recurrence, and I write a question mark here because it's not clear like whether this actually makes any sense, but if this were the recurrence, then you know the solution of this recurrence would be that the quantum cost is at most the square root of n. Right, that that's the solution of this recurrence because you're instead of building up sort of the you know factor of two every time you divide things in half, you build up a factor square root of two, and you get you get this for the solution of that recurrence. Okay, but this is totally unjustified uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, this too has some interpretation that it's like the number of times you're calling this subroutine, right? But there's no such thing as solving you know square root of two instances of the problem, right? I mean, square root of two is not an integer, so this this kind of doesn't even make sense. Um, you know, the reason we might think that we could put a square root of two here quantumly is that we can compute or with like the square root of the, the quantum cost, but the query complexity, the quantum query complexity of or is only big O of the square root of n. So somehow, you know, I mean, the solution of this recurrence is really sensitive to, um, you know, the particular value that you put here. And if, if, you know, you could just put there something that's big O of square root of two, in other words, just some constant, like you wouldn't necessarily get here specifically the square root of n. Um, and another issue that comes up, you know, sometimes in 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 general with sort of quantum algorithms where you try to apply recursion is that when you have bounded error subroutines, you have to worry about how the error could build up, right? Since Grover's algorithm has bounded error, if you would just sort of use it without doing anything to control the error, then, um, you know, those errors would grow and you would get an algorithm that didn't have, you know, good performance guarantees when you sort of apply these subroutines recursively. Uh, and so you would have to do additional work to do that. And of course, take into account the overhead that might uh, come in you know, when you try to maybe use repetition to sort of, um, you know, reduce the error. 
So, you know, this, while this is sort of like a nice story and that like, you know, if you would have this recursion, you would get the answer that, that you think ought to come out. Um, you know, it's, it's not really sort of like justified at the level of thinking about, um, quantum query complexity. Okay. Um, uh, nevertheless, it is possible possible to make this to make sense out of this story. Um, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to see that sort of, you know, there is some some technology that we can use to make this uh, make this idea make sense and have this kind of a, a recurrence. OK, so the the sort of general you know thing that we're going to see in um, this kind of, uh, you know, quantum version of divide and conquer is that, you know, when we have some uh, classical recurrence arising from some way of trying to classically divide and conquer for the problem um, under appropriate conditions, we're going to be able to get a corresponding quantum algorithm with quantum speed up. And um, so th what this is going to look like in general is the following. So, you know, a typical sort of, you know, classical divide and conquer recurrence is going to involve dividing some instance of size n into some number of instances, say a instances of size n over b. These instances could be overlapping in some way. So it doesn't have to be that a equals b. It could be you know, that, they, that they're related in some more general way. Um, and then the recurrence is going to say that the cost of solving this instance of size n is going to be at most a times the cost of solving the instance of size n over b, plus some auxiliary work that you have to do to combine those solutions. And so what we're going to do, you know, under sort of appropriate conditions, which we'll we'll talk about, um, is to is to uh, you know explain that we can get a corresponding quantum divide and conquer recurrence, where basically we get to take the square root of a. Uh, so if this is something like you know uh, we're we're sort of like you know taking the sort of logical or of these a instances, then in that case uh, we're going to be able to do something like getting the square root of a here. And also for the auxiliary work that we do to combine these solutions, we're going to be able to use a quantum algorithm. Um, so, so that's also a, a place where we can potentially get some speed up. And so if the cost of solving the auxiliary problem is just big O of, you know, this, this auxiliary cost, um, then we're going to be able to put this auxiliary cost here. Okay. All right. So that's, um, that's sort of like the kind of result we're going to have uh, in the framework of quantum query complexity. So all of the work that I'm going to tell you about today, we're going to focus specifically on analyzing the quantum query complexity, not the time complexity of the algorithms. I think some of the algorithms that I'm going to tell you about, you could give kind of corresponding results about the time complexity. In some cases, it's not so clear. But to, you know, to keep the picture simple, we're going to focus on um, the query complexity. right? So the, the model of query complexity is going to give us a kind of a way of um, you know, a sort of a very clean way of comparing the power of classical and quantum computers, where, you know, the input is going to be described by a black box. So the input you can imagine is some string over some alphabet. Um, and we have the ability to query the entries of that string to learn a particular character, uh, where quantum mechanically, we're allowed to make queries in superposition to different characters uh, of the string, to different positions of that string. And um, the kind of question we want to answer is how many queries do we need to make to learn some given property of the input? Uh, and we can talk about this in you know various with respect to various notions of query complexity. We can talk about the classical deterministic query complexity, where we just ask for a deterministic algorithm. You know how many queries does it take to find the right answer? Uh, we can talk about randomized algorithms that allow you know themselves to make random choices in deciding what to query, and then we only require that the algorithm is right with bounded error. So let's say with success probability at least two thirds. Um, and then the kind of quantum model is like a kind of a quantum analog of this randomized model, where again, we sort of only demand, um, you know, bounded error. So let's say that the quantum algorithm succeeds with probability at least two thirds, but it's allowed to make queries in quantum superposition, right? So this is going to be the kind of the setting in which we're going to operate. Um, and, you know, there, there are many problems that have been studied in this model of query complexity. You know, we've talked already about the, this problem of computing the logical or of the bits. Uh, and, you know, this is a problem for which the deterministic and randomized query complexities, you know, these classical query complexities are big theta of n, and there's a quadratic quantum speed up, right? The quantum query complexity of this function is, is big theta of square root of n. So this is kind of the, the comparison that we're interested in making is, you know, seeing that we can get a quantum speed up relative to the, the classical query complexities for um, a variety of problems. And, you know, I'll, I'll explain some examples of this divide and conquer framework, um, you know, that, that show these kinds of speed ups. Okay, another kind of like technical idea that's going to play a role in the this quantum divide and conquer framework, and this is kind of the the key idea that's going to allow us to make sense of you know um, 
solving square root of two subproblems, right? which is something that you know <laughs> sort of doesn't make sense uh, at the level of quantum uh, quantum algorithms, but kind of does make sense at the level of a of a sort of more abstract uh, measure of of um, you know algorithmic difficulty that we're going to to consider uh, is this thing called the quantum adversary method. So the quantum adversary method uh, is something that was developed as a way of proving lower bounds on quantum query complexity. Uh, but it actually turns out that for a, a, a sufficiently general version of this uh, this quantum adversary uh, notion, it, it actually always gives tight bounds. So um, in, so in particular, you know, if you can find the sort of like optimal value of this this quantum adversary quantity, then um, that tells you not just a lower bound on the quantum query complexity, but actually an upper bound uh, on the quantum query complexity. Um, so let me just briefly explain uh, what this quantum adversary method does. So imagine that we have some function that we would like to compute um, from some set of inputs S uh, to some set of outputs T. So we're given, you know, the input to, to a, for a given problem is a string that comes from this set S. Um, S is a string over some alphabet sigma. It's a string of length N. Um, and the, the black box allows us to query um, the individual characters of that string. Right. So, um, you know, we can say we can ask, you know, what is the ith character of X um, and the black box will tell us what it is. And now our goal is to compute F of X. Right. So F is the like the problem that we're trying to solve. Right. So, for example, for the for the unstructured search problem, you know, F would be the or function. Um, and now the adversary quantity and the details of this expression are sort of not really important, but the adversary quantity is some some particular uh, you know function of this problem that you're trying to solve, um, which characterizes the quantum query complexity. So it has some you know some expression in terms of some you know um, ratio of spectral norms, which is like not at all important for this talk. Um, all that matters is just that it's some kind of well-defined quantity that for any given problem you can compute, uh, and it turns out that um, the quantum query complexity is you know, within a constant factor of this adversary quantity. So basically up to constant factors, this adversary quantity characterizes the quantum query complexity. Okay. Um, and you know, one of the other properties that the adversary quantity has, which is gonna be crucial for developing this divide and conquer framework is that it behaves very nicely with respect to composition. So if you think about a function um, that you would like to compute, you know, a function of your black box input that you would like to compute, and that function can be expressed as some kind of composition of other functions, then often you can express the adversary quantity of the composed function uh, in a simple way in terms of the adversary quantities of the constituent functions. All right. So let me mention two kind of notions of composition that are going to play a role in our divide and conquer framework. Um, so if we have um, if we have an or, a logical or of two functions, f1 and f2, then the square of the adversary quantity of this composed function, that's the logical or of f1 and f2, is at most the sum of the squares of the adversary quantities of the individual functions, right? And this is where you can see kind of this square root of two playing a, a role, right? If you would just take the logical or of two, uh, of two bits, then the adversary quantity of that logical or, you know, would be at most the square root of two times the, times the, the cost of computing those individual bits. Um, and this actually generalizes to like arbitrary and or formulas. Um, the other property we're going to use is a kind of a composition that's that's um, arguably a little bit more straightforward, which is what we call switch case composition. So the idea here is that you have some function, um, you know, f that you're going to compute. And then the value of f is going to tell you which function g you want to compute, right? So we're kind of switching on the value of f to determine which of the g's we want to apply to the input. Um, and what you can show, and, and maybe this is not so surprising, this kind of statement would, would kind of clearly be true at the level of algorithms, but it's also true at the level of the adversary quantity, um, that the adversary quantity of this composed function uh, is at most, you know, big O of the adversary quantities of the, of the functions F plus the largest of the, um, the Gs, right? So um, yeah, you might imagine that this kind of makes sense because what you're doing is basically, I mean, the natural way to compute H is to first compute F and then compute the relevant G and that, you know, the cost of that G could be as large as the, the largest of the GSs. Okay, so these are two uh, kind of, um, you know, adversary composition properties, and these are going to uh, play a role in kind of our, our quantum divide and conquer framework uh, as follows. So if we have a function that we can compute as an and or formula of a bunch of functions, you know, f1 through fa, and then there's some auxiliary function that we that we also can compute once we have the values of, of these functions um, uh, to, to, so that we can compute the overall function f, 
um, then you can give this kind of uh, upper bound on the adversary quantity of f. And this just follows immediately from these you know, composition rules that were explained on the, on the previous slide. Similarly, if you compute f by first computing some value s uh, and then computing some other function gs, then you can use the switch case composition rule uh, to you know, upper bound the adversary quantity of f. Um, and so these are going to be sort of primitives that we can use in this quantum divide and conquer framework uh, to design, uh, you know, these upper bounds on, on quantum query complexity by sort of dividing our, our problem into subproblems. Um, and so what we're going to see, um, you know, in, in sort of our applications of these, of these um, you know, these upper bounds is that we're really going to be combining the adversary method um, with kind of the sort of quantum algorithms way of thinking about, uh, you know, upper bounds on quantum query complexity in a sort of um, uh, kind of very extensive way, right? So there are going to be parts of this recursion where uh, we really care about getting the, the constant right. It's going to be crucial to have the sort of like the, the master theorem, you know, solve the recurrence to get the, the upper bound that we would really that we would, would really like to have for that constant to be right. And so, you know, in parts of these uh, recurrences, it's going to be crucial that we don't have a big O, that we're really, you know, by working in the adversary world, we can really get a tight constant. Um, but for parts of the algorithm, maybe we can think, we can just think about designing a quantum algorithm and, you know, that can be loose by a constant factor, um, but that's going to be okay, you know, potentially for some part of the recurrence. And so we'll see this, you know, concretely in some examples. So, you know, if you're familiar with kind of, you know, the, the adversary method and quantum query complexity, you may know that this idea of getting upper bounds by sort of composing the um, the, quantum uh, the quantum adversary quantity, you know, using these composition properties of the quantum adversary quantity, you know, this is something that has arisen in, in a lot of previous work. For example, this is, you know, a way you can understand the quantum query complexity of and or formulas. Um, but I think what's kind of novel about this quantum divide and conquer framework is that it's really kind of going back and forth at every level of this recursion, you know, between the quantum adversary way of thinking about things and the quantum algorithms way of thinking about things. And this is kind of giving us more flexibility uh, to come up with upper bounds on quantum query complexity than maybe would be a bit harder to see if we would kind of work exclusively in the quantum adversary world or in the um, quantum algorithms world. So probably the the best way to understand you know what I mean by this is to actually look at some applications. Um, so so that's what I'm going to try to do for the the rest of the talk. Um, okay, so um, there are four kind of basic applications that we give in this paper. You know we hope that there will be more, but this is what we have uh, you know have found so far. So first of all, we look at some problems that have been considered before, where we give you know basically the same upper bounds that were known before. We just tighten tighten some of the log factors, uh, but we give basically the same the same uh, upper bounds with only slight improvement, but with you know arguably simpler analysis using this divide and conquer idea. Um, so we do this for uh, a problem related to recognizing regular languages. Um, uh, specifically, it's this problem of deciding whether a string over this, you know, three character alphabet uh, contains a substring that looks like this, a two followed by some number of zeros followed by a two. Um, this may seem like a very kind of, you know, specific and uh, kind of arbitrary uh, problem, but this recognizing this particular language was kind of a key part of this quantum query complexity trichotomy for regular languages in this uh, very nice paper by Aronson, Greer, and Schaefer. Um, so that's one of the, the um, problems that we look at. And the other, uh, uh, another of these uh, class of problems are some kind of like string minimality problems um, that are considered in this uh, paper on the quantum query complexity of string problems by uh, Akmal and Jin uh, that came out last year. Uh, and so we, you know, for at least for some decision versions of these problems, we're able to give, you know, this simplified and um, slightly tightened analysis. And then we also consider some problems that really haven't been considered uh, in the quantum query complexity literature before, um, which are um, the sort of like the increasing subsequence problem uh, and the common subsequence problem. So you may you may be familiar with like the longest increasing subsequence problem and the longest common subsequence problem. These are problems you might have seen in a you know in a course on algorithms. Um, and uh, so I'll explain why for for those sort of like you know problems of finding the, the longest uh, subsequences of these kind, uh, there's not a quantum speed up. But if we consider this parameterized version where we ask for a given k, you know, is there an increasing subsequence of length k, or do two strings have a common subsequence of length k? Uh, for these problems, you can get uh, a quantum speed up. Uh, and this is something that was not, not known before. And this is, this is kind of like the main new application that we give for this quantum divide and conquer framework. 
Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain, um, you know, as sort of a warm up, uh, the the divide quantum divide and conquer algorithm for this uh, regular language recognition problem, and then I'll talk about, you know, the in increasing subsequence problem, which is, you know, the first of these two new results, uh, and that may be all that there's time for, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, so let's start with this uh, kind of regular language uh, recognition problem. Okay, so this the setup is, as I mentioned before, we've got uh, an alphabet with uh, three symbols. So let's say zero, one, and two. And the problem is, you know, that we're given some string over this alphabet. It could be, you know, any string over this alphabet. And we want to know, you know, is it in this regular language? So, you know, as I said before, this is just asking, is there a substring that looks like a two followed by some number of zeros followed by a two? Okay, and there's a very natural way to divide and conquer for this uh, for this um, problem, which is as follows. So um, the the string is going to contain that kind of a substring, uh, if and only if one of the three possible uh, following possible thing happens. So if we divide this string into a left half and a right half, it could be that a substring like this is entirely in the left half of the string. It could be that it's entirely in the right half. Okay, but that doesn't cover all the possibilities. There's also uh, the possibility that the string sort of starts in the left half and finishes in the right half, right? Um, and so if that's uh, the case, what that means is that the left half ends with a two followed by some number of zeros, and the right half starts with some number of zeros followed by a two. So that's another kind of condition that we would have to check. But notice that these first two conditions, this is really just solving an instance of the original problem on a string of half the length. Right, and this it turns out is something that we can do with not too much additional work, okay. And and not only not too much additional work, but with work that we can, um, you know, we can do faster with a quantum algorithm than we could with a classical one. Okay, in particular, <clears throat> if we want to check whether we're in this case, whether we have such a string that kind of bridges the left half and the right half, um, we can do that by Grover search in square root of n time. Because what we can do is we can search for the last two in the left half and the first two in the right half. Those are both things we can do with, with time like square root of n. And then we can we can use um, also unstructured search to tell whether there's a whether there's a non-zero in the string between them to figure out whether you know it really is the case that you know um, we have the the needed you know string of zeros between the two twos, right? So overall, that's something we can do with um, with cost like square root of n. We're now here. We're thinking about the cost in the quantum algorithms world, right? Because you know that's kind of a natural way to think about solving this problem. But of course, it also means that the adversary quantity of you know answering this yes no question uh, is also big O of square root of n, right? Okay, so this then gives us a recurrence for the quantum adversary quantity for this problem, which is that the the square root of the adversary, uh, sorry, the square of the adversary quantity is at most twice the square of the adversary quantum quantity for an instance of half the size. So here's where we're going to get basically a square root of two if we think about the, you know, um, the adversary quantity instead of its square, um, you know, plus a term that's big O of the square root of n, well, squared if we're kind of adding things up in quadrature as they do for the, for the, um, you know, use of these composition rules. Um, but if we sort of solve this recurrence, what we find is that the um, the adversary quantity for an instance of size n is like big O of square root of n log n, right? So this is like the, um, you know, sort of the same result that appeared in this kind of, you know, Aronson, Greer, and, and Schaefer, um, uh, you know, paper, but with an arguably simpler proof, at least once you understand this kind of quantum divide and conquer framework, and I guess the log factors are maybe slightly improved. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. I don't know, are there questions about what's going on here? Not maybe I'll go on to another. Oh yeah. Tom. Um. So does um does that the the, the quantum um sorry uh divine conquer works for any other regular languages beyond that particular one that you know? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think we haven't looked at that um question explicitly. So I think you know um that this kind of like trichotomy theorem, which appears in this paper, really kind of uses this this fact that you can recognize this language and basically like square root of n time kind of as a subroutine to kind of like handle the general cases. So I, I my, my impression is that kind of once you have this result, uh, you can kind of use it and standard ideas to get to understand the quantum query complexity of regular languages in general. Okay. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know if there's, I mean, maybe there are sort of natural ways of applying this idea specifically to other regular languages where something interesting would happen, but I, I haven't looked at that in detail. 
But what you're saying is there is potential for like a statement that for any regular language, we can get an exact characterization using this method. Use yeah, I mean, reactions and I mean, I don't know, but I think that up to up to log factors. So everything is only up to log factors. But um, you know, uh, in this in this paper, I think they really sort of show that um, they, they really give basically a tight characterization of the query quantum query complexity of recognizing general regular languages. And I think you know that really follows from, from you know basically like this result plus standard stuff. You know, kind of like Grover search. And so I think it I think it kind of you know follows in some sense. But whether it would somehow be Kind of easier to capture the kind of the full picture for general regular languages by doing kind of doing the whole thing directly using divide and conquer. I I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, maybe Noah has a question. Uh, hi, hi, Andrew. Um, I was interested. To think, was thinking about the, the sort of the quantum states which must emerge or must uh -huh. be under the hood here somehow. And so, obviously, when, once you've once you've divided. I mean, whatever quantum state is going to be needed to do the subproblem is only sort of entangled over the smaller subunit. Uh, I mean, you don't need to have entanglement between the two halves. We use a, you've reduced the problem to a smaller problem. So somehow, is it in, inevitable that you get some some part of the problem where you need an entangled state over the, the whole problem? Um, I mean, or, or I wonder if that's a way of of sort of saying you know you, you can't go beyond a certain a certain amount of speed up because the subproblems only have entangled states in the smaller size. So it's, if, if you know somehow you need a large entangled state, probably you can't do too much of this. Um, I'm not sure that that's, probably... I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure that that's the case because I think that, um, so, I mean, the, the, um, the sort of picture of what's happening at the level of how the quantum algorithm would actually operate is, you know, kind of complicated because there's this going back and forth between, you know, adversary quantities and and um, quantum algorithms kind of at all levels of the recursion. But, you know, I mean, uh, just sort of like roughly, uh, I mean, this kind of merging part, right, this kind of like solving, solving this, um, uh, you know, you know, figuring out whether this string that kind of bridges the two parts, I mean, it's doing something that's really looking, that's really combining, it's really doing something quantum that's kind of combining information from the two parts. So it is, you know, it's doing a Grover search over kind of like, you know, that's kind of not just restricted to the left part and the right half. So I think it's, I think it's probably generating states that are entangled, you know, kind of uh, globally, right? And then this is also happening kind of at every level of the recursion as you divide into subproblems. So I think it's, I mean, I think it's the case that the um, the quantum algorithm for this problem somehow, you know, really has the potential to generate kind of um, entanglement across the entire uh you know, it's, sorry, sort of to make entangled queries to the entire string. I guess I was trying to say, I think that must be the case. You must have some component of the algorithm which that happens. Right. Otherwise, you sort of end up convincing yourself you don't really need very much entanglement. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I don't know specifically what, um, I mean, there must be some limitations that sort of say that, yeah, if, if you don't have that happening, that somehow you can't be getting... Um, significant speed up, but I guess I don't know of specific kind of quantitative statements along those lines. But it, I mean, yeah, it sounds like something like that must be true. It, it might give you a sort of an insight into what what the combining thing needs to look like. Right. Because that's the place where you do really do have the whole problem sitting in front of you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. So I, I do want to do maybe at least one of the, um, you know, examples of <laughs> kind of a new problem that we that we looked at using this uh, using this approach. So um, so let's maybe talk um, at least about this uh, increasing subsequence problem. Um, so now we're talking about, you know, whereas in the previous problem, we were talking about substrings. Now we're really talking about subsequences. So a subsequence of a string is something that you can obtain by taking a subset of the characters where you can't change their order, but they don't have to be consecutive. Um, and now uh, there's there's kind of a well-studied problem, which is called the longest increasing subsequence problem, which asks whether, um, which asks, um, you know, if you're given a string X over some some alphabet and that alphabet has to have, you know, the symbols of that alphabet, you know, need to have some order. So you could imagine, let's say that these are integers. Um, so you, have, you can say something about characters being bigger than other characters. Um, now the question is to find a longest increasing subsequence of um, this string X, right? So for example, if we have, you know, this, uh, this string, you know, eight six seven five three zero oh, nine. The longest increasing subsequence, I think, in this case, it's actually unique, is uh, six seven nine, right? And um, 
so, you know, you can ask in general if you want to find, uh, you know, the length of longest increasing sub subsequence, or you actually want to find the longest increasing subsequence or a longest increasing subsequence, you know, what is the, the cost of doing that? And could we get a quantum speed up for that problem? Uh, and unfortunately, the answer is no, because um, it's not hard to see that that um, quantum mechanically, you know, for this kind of general problem of of looking for the um, longest increasing subsequence, um, the cost is is linear. Like um, you you just uh, have to, in general, query you know um, a, a linear number of positions to be able to to tell uh, what is you know even just to say uh, to find you know the length of the longest increasing subsequence. Um, so what we can do instead to, to have got kind of to look at a version of this problem where we can actually get some interesting speed up uh, is to ask not about the longest increasing subsequence, but whether there's an increasing subsequence of length k for some k that's fixed, right? So you should imagine now that we're going to consider k being a constant, like k could be three or 10 or something like that, but it's fixed. It's not something that we're going to allow um, to kind of vary as a function of the input. Um, and so now uh, things are a little bit more interesting. In the quantum context, so classically, um, you know, this problem is sort of like hard already. Um, uh, you know, if we consider consider uh, lengths of two, right? So, you know, the increasing subsequence problem of length one, this is not so interesting. Like, there's always an increasing subsequence of length one. Um, but already, if we ask if there's an increasing subsequence of length two, this already takes maximal query complexity. Classically, you can probably convince yourself it's basically unstructured search. Um, but quantum mechanically. You can solve that two increasing subsequence problem uh, in time like square root of n. That's um, you know uh, again basically because it's equivalent to unstructured search. Um, now, if you think about you know this problem for larger values of k, um, you can solve it. You know it's kind of easy to see that you can solve it with a query complexity of like n to the k over k plus one using this idea of, of M minus, this K distinctness algorithm, which actually is an algorithm that will solve, you know, will sort of allow you to um, answer any question that just depends on subsets of size K. Um, so, you know, applying that algorithm sort of shows you that you can get this upper bound on the query complexity, but this is something that's going to get worse and worse as K gets bigger and bigger. So like if K is a hundred, you know, this is going to be like almost linear in it. Um, and so the question is, can we do better? And what we can show using this divide and conquer idea is that actually we can do much better than this. Um, actually, you know, what we what we show is that actually for any fixed K, um, there's an upper bound of basically like square root of N. Now there's some log factors that grow with K, um, but like, you know, if K is fixed, then this is something that is sort of like, you know, negligible for large N. Okay, so let me just explain how this works using um, quantum divide and conquer. Um, so we're gonna again, do something a bit like what we did in the, um, you know, the uh, uh, regular language recognition problem that I mentioned before. We're going to divide into left half, uh, a left half and a right half. And we're going to, um, uh, you know, look at the possible ways that the string could contain an increasing subsequence of length k. So it could be that that subsequence is entirely contained on the left. It could be that it's entirely contained on the right. Or it could be that there's an increasing subsequence of length k that bridges the left half and the right half. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways that could happen. There could be i elements on the left and k minus i, I elements on the right for lots of different values of i. Um, but what you can uh, you know, convince yourself is that you can check this, this last condition by solving instances of this increasing subsequence problem for smaller values of, of i, you know, for values of i from like one up through, uh, you know, I guess uh, k minus one. Um, uh, by, yeah, basically like, um, uh, yeah, solving something that looks like instances of this of this increasing subsequence problem of uh, smaller sizes and sort of searching over different ways that they could appear. And you can show that this can be done um, by solving these this increasing subsequence problem for these smaller sizes, um, like, uh, you know, a, a logarithmic number of times and sort of also using Grover search. So the details of exactly how, how this... Um, uh, you know, works, maybe we don't have time for, but hopefully you can convince yourself, you know, you're basically looking at sort of like these smaller instances of the problem and searching over different possibilities to kind of figure out how you could bridge things between the left and the right half. Um, and so, you know, once you sort of observe this, you get this kind of a recurrence for the adversary quantity that says that the square of the adversary quantity is at most twice the square of the quantity for an instance of half the size, now with like the same value of K, um, plus a term that's big O of the cost of solving, solving these instances for smaller values of K um, with some additional you know, logarithmic overhead. 
And um, so if you solve this, you know, recurrence, well, basically by, by induction on K, you know, you can get uh, this conclusion that the cost is only like square root of N up to these logarithmic factors. Yeah, so um, so that's uh, kind of the, the first kind of like new uh, example of a quantum query complexity upper bound that we've given using this framework. There's another, um, you know, problem that we look at, which is the longest common subsequence problem. And uh, I think maybe in the interest of time, maybe I'm not going to sort of go through all the details, but maybe let me just sort of like tell you what the what the problem is and what is the kind of like interesting thing that happens with the, the solution for it. So this longest com common subsequence problem asks, uh, what is the longest longest subsequence of two input strings x and y um, that appears in both of them, and that's you know a, as long as possible? Um, uh, and so yeah, so for example, the longest common subsequence of quantum and algorithm would be would be ATM, right? So these uh, you know characters don't have to be consecutive, but they have to appear in the same order. Um, and so we again have a kind of a similar story that the the quantum query complexity of the full longest common subsequence problem is just maximal. But if we parameterize it in this way, we just ask, is there a common subsequence of length K? Then um, we can sort of like hope for a quantum speed up. Um, and, you know, what you can sort of show is that, um, you know, for for the kind of common subsequence problem of length one, this is basically like the element distinctness problem. So the cost is like N to the two thirds. Um, but sort of like the the kind of well-known kind of quantum algorithmic ideas give us an algorithm that would have worse and worse query complexity as K grows. Uh, and so you can ask if you can do better than this. And so what we what we show for this problem is that, um, you know, you can solve it in um, cost that scales like N to the two thirds, um, actually for any fixed value of K, just with some additional, you know, log factors where the number of log factors just grows with K. Right, so this is as compared with a with a classical query complexity of like n for any of these values of k, and uh, yeah, I think we don't have time to kind of uh, talk about the details of this algorithm, but I just want to highlight one kind of feature of the of the analysis, which is a little bit uh, surprising and and maybe kind of interesting, which is that um, you know in the divide and conquer examples that we've seen so far, and in like you know almost all of the examples of divide and conquer that I know about, the right thing to do is to divide the problem into two parts. You know, you could come up with a sort of a more sophisticated, you know, version of dividing things up where you divide it up into three parts or four parts or something like that. But like typically it wouldn't give you any performance advantage. But somehow for this problem, at least, um, you know, with the way of dividing things up that we, um, you know, know of, um, we get this, this, um, quantum speed up, this kind of, you know, nearly optimal quantum speed up, um, but by dividing into seven parts, and we would not get it if we would divide it into only six parts or a smaller number of parts. So yeah, I mean, this is just, you know, comes from some details about how exactly the divide and conquer works, which I think we don't have time for, but it's something kind of surprising, uh, you know, that happens in the, in the analysis. Um, yeah, I would say that the sort of like analysis of the algorithm, you know, for this problem is is definitely a little bit more complicated than the ones that we've seen so far. Um, and if you're interested in it, you know, it's it's explained. I mean, it, uh, it's not not too involved and it's explained in, in detail in the paper. OK, so maybe that's a good place to um, to try to wrap up. So, you know, what we've done in this work is we've we've developed this divide and conquer framework for quantum algorithms. Um, and I think you know, a lot of the kind of technical ingredients that go into this work, you know, are things that were like pretty well known, right? I mean, it's kind of like uh, standard quantum algorithms plus adversary composition, which is something that, you know, we've, we've definitely known about. But I think the thing that's sort of novel about, um, you know, this work is that we um, kind of combine these ingredients in new ways um, and in a way that allows us to really sort of think pretty classically about the way you design these algorithms, right? I mean, there's kind of a, a, a you know, applying this framework uh, amounts to kind of like, you know, dividing the problem into subproblems in the right way and thinking about how to combine the solutions of the subproblems in a, you know, in a basically kind of classical way. Um, but because you can get some, uh, you know, improvements to the kind of recurrence that you get when you try to, to um, you know, express the cost of these kinds of solutions, uh, you know, you can, you can be led to faster algorithms, um, you know, if you sort of like set things up in the, in the right way. Um, so, um, you know, we've, we've shown how to apply this to, you know, some problems that had been studied before, and we give these new quantum upper bounds for the query complexity of the, the these parameterized increasing subsequence and common subsequence problems. Um, you know, I guess we hope that there will be will be more applications of this framework. 
Um, so, um, you know, I think in general, like trying to apply this framework to other problems could be an interesting thing to do. Um, I guess some kind of specific things that that we thought maybe would be interesting to investigate um, include the following. So um, one of the kind of limitations of this framework, as I've described it, is that it's really kind of limited to decision problems. And this kind of comes from, you know, kind of limitations of the um, the way that, that adversary um, composition uh, you know, can be applied. Um, and, and so we don't really know how to do this kind of divide and conquer um, kind of algorithm design directly at the level of search problems, you know, kind of non, non-decision problems. Um, so, you know, sometimes we could solve kind of search versions of problems if there's some, you know, search to decision reduction, but it's a kind of like important for our applications of this framework that we work at the level of, of decision problems. Um, so for example, I think a nice example of this is like the minimum finding problem, right? If you've, if you've got, um, you know, a string and you want to find the kind of smallest element in it, we know that that's something you can do, um, with quantum query complexity square root of N, um, but we don't know how to do that in a kind of divide and conquer way. Um, and so that's something that we sort of like tried to do and didn't succeed in doing. And I think if we if we had a way of doing that, it would maybe um, be useful for sort of unlocking um, ways of dividing and conquering for uh, search problems more generally. Um, another sort of possibility is to try to um, use kind of more general composition rules, right? So that we talked about this and or and switch case composition, but there's a lot of other adversary composition, uh, you know, principles that are known, and it's possible that those could lead to other quantum algorithms. So I think that would be interesting to investigate. Um, and finally, you know, there's no reason in principle that we should be limited to only uh, quadratic speed up or, you know, even to only polynomial speed up. Uh, there are examples of super polynomial speed ups um, that have been discovered using adversary composition. Uh, so um, it would be, you know, great if we could apply this kind of quantum divide and conquer idea to get new examples of super polynomial quantum speed ups. Okay, so maybe that's a good place to stop and, and I'd be happy to take uh, any more questions if there are any. Thank you, thank you, Andrew, uh, for a wonderful talk. I have a question. Um, so, how critical it is for, for you to have the non-overlapping subproblems? Because when I'm thinking about divide and conquer and dynamic programming, for example, you know, there's uh, there's perhaps th 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 this are quite different techniques, although they are not uncommon, not unrelated, perhaps. Right. Yeah. So. Um... Uh, so I think in this, you know, common subsequence problem, like we didn't, we didn't really, um, oh shoot. Um, sorry, I think I lost the screen share. In this common subsequence problem, you know, we didn't, um, we didn't sort of like, you know, get into it, but the subproblems are somehow overlapping, uh, you know, in, in sort of our application of, of this idea. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's critical for you know getting the upper bounds that we that we get, and so that's definitely something that you know our framework will allow, and um, and yeah, so I mean we have that flexibility. Um, you mentioned you know also uh, dynamic programming, and uh, you know I think there's there's been some work, and actually this is kind of what we were thinking about when we were kind of ultimately led to these algorithms. You know, there's been some work on thinking about how maybe we can speed up. Um, uh, dynamic programming algorithms with quantum computers. And it's it's kind of not so clear how we might be able to do this because, you know, classical uh, dynamic programming algorithms um, seem kind of inherently sequential, right? They sort of like, they, they accumulate a bunch of information and they need to sort of rely on that information to kind of like, you know, compute more information. And it's kind of hard to imagine how we, how we might, um, you know, how we might be able to sort of like take those algorithms and speed them up quantumly. So there are some cases where like, you know, some problems that are classically solved by dynamic programming have been sped up quantumly, sometimes maybe using some dynamic programming kind of ideas, but it's sort of limited what you can do. And I think this is another nice question to sort of think about how to, you know, like somehow the more overlapping the subproblems can be, you know, the sort of the harder it is to to actually get some quantum speed up. And I guess what this this kind of thing shows is that we really somehow can get you know, to some extent, take advantage of overlapping subproblems, but um, how far you can push that? I mean, I think it's a nice question. Thanks. Uh, I think someone else, someone else has a question. Shashwat Shukla. Uh, was that? To comment on how you can think sort of at the level of classical algorithm design, breaking down problems. Uh, but I want to ask you how 
um, the algorithm is constructed when we sort of go down all the way to the the details of it. I understand that you have this adversary uh, quantity composition going on. Does that mean that you're prescribing that you then build like the span program and apply like span program algorithm techniques? And I'm wondering how specifically that interfaces with your algorithms that you're saying are like, you know, the, the combining algorithms where you're you're saying you're alternating between them. So how, how do you get a span program that both is a span program and does these other algorithms? Right. So, I mean, I guess, you know, what we do in the paper is just, it just, you know, gives some kind of existence result, you know, kind of, we, we sort of show that there's an upper bound on the quantum query complexity. But I mean, I guess that this does, you know, kind of implicitly mean that there is a quantum algorithm that has, has the query complexity that we that we state and like the way you would get that would be indeed like um basically to like go back and forth between sort of the adversary quantity and the quantum query complexity world at every level of the recursion and the way you do you know a way that you can do that as you were saying is like with span programs right so you know or with kind of the adversary dual which is maybe another way of of, of thinking about it it doesn't have to be kind of explicitly span programs but yeah basically like um you know uh you can sort of like um you know, go from this sort of adversary solution to a, a quantum algorithm by sort of like constructing the dual of this semi-definite program. And then there's an algorithm that basically does, you know, phase estimation on some quantum walk that reflects about some subspaces that are defined by these vectors that show up in the in the dual of the of the adversary semi-definite program. Um, and so yeah, that that you know it gives you some explicit quantum algorithm that you know would would solve the problem but now you you're going to have to do that kind of at every level of the recursion to really kind of like express what is the overall quantum algorithm for solving the problem um so it's kind of messy like if you would actually want to kind of compile this you know description of a of a of a quantum algorithm into an explicit quantum algorithm that you could run for the problem um it's it's a little bit messy but in principle you can do it yeah cool thanks Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question about um, element distinctness. So uh, okay. for the increasing subsequence and the common um, subsequence problems, the mm -hmm. earlier upper bounds were from k element distinctness, right? So can you apply uh, this technique directly to k element distinctness to get something better than enter the k over k plus one, do you think, uh, to, tight, to get tight bounds? Oh, um, so... Uh, okay, it's a good question. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think not. I mean, I think the, um, so I think the, um, so, I mean, we're actually, I guess, looking not, not, um, necessarily specifically at the K distinctness problem, but this kind of like K subset finding problem, like looking for sort of like subsets of size K with some property. And I think this, you know, N to the K over K plus one is really optimal for that problem. Like, I think that's been shown. I don't think you, I don't think there is a better algorithm. Um, uh, and if you, if you talk about K distinctness specifically, I guess there is a slightly better algorithm. Um, but again, I think this is already known. And so, but I don't, I'm not sure um that sort of applying these ideas is going to is going to lead like using using this quantum divide and conquer is going to lead to better algorithms for for those problems even in the cases where you where you can improve it a little bit i'm not i'm not totally sure but i but i um uh somehow i think it's maybe unlikely okay okay great thanks sure. another question Jing uh, yeah um my question is, uh, in the slides, you like take an example or merge sort to use the classical divider and conquer to solve it. Can we use the quantum divider and conquer to get some speed up to solve the merge sort problem? Oh, okay. That's an interesting question. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think not, um, because, um, well, I mean, I think basically that merge, like we're not going to be able to speed up quantumly, like somehow you have to make a pass through everything and it's kind of not clear how you would get some improvement. Now, the problem in general of like sorting, um, you know, and, and sort of like understanding the quantum, uh, cost of that, there is an interesting open question, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, what, what, so, so you can show that actually it's not possible to do better than a constant factor faster, uh, quantum mechanically for, for, um, sorting, or, I mean, it's real, it's related to the problem of just, um, you know, ordered search, right? So if you have an ordered list and you want to find a given item in that list, um, you know, uh, that's something you can do in time like log n classically, it's really like one times log n, 
And then there's a question of quantumly, what's the best you can do? And, and there, are, there are upper and lower bounds showing that the right answer is some constant times log n. Um, and actually that mm -hmm. constant is, is not known. Um, the best okay. lower bound is that it's like two over pi times the natural log of n. And, and maybe that's okay. actually the right answer. Maybe that's actually what the upper bound should be. But um, uh, that's actually an open question. Like it, it's just about pinning down a constant factor, you know, but it's like somehow a very fundamental constant. So it's actually a question that I like. And I mean, it's related to the problem of sorting because I think it would be the same constant for sorting as for, as for um, ordered search. Okay, and but I don't I, think I don't think divide and conquer has anything to say about it, at least as far as I know. Okay, and another is I for the search problems because from my understanding, I feel that the LCS is also a search problem, right? Because we need we try to search. So here you see, can we apply quantum divide and conquer to the search problems? In fact, I feel that you have done the quantum divide and conquer to the search problem. So well, so the the specific problem that we looked at was the problem of deciding whether there's a common subsequence of length k. Um, now, in this case, maybe I would have to think about this. I don't remember. Maybe there's a search to decision reduction or maybe not. I'm not sure. Maybe if you can, maybe if you can, um, you know, tell whether there is a common subsequence of length k, maybe you can do something to quickly find it, you know, using the the um, decision problem as a subroutine. Yeah. And I'm for the... Sure. for the search problem, in fact, we have known for the unstructured search problem, then the most hard problem is using the Grover's algorithm directly. So that's why if we use quantum divide conquer, we want to get more speed up than Grover or we what's the benefits? We use a quantum divide conquer to this search problem because- yeah. Oh, oh yeah, right. So, so for this minimum finding problem, like we already know how to do that in time like squared events. So there would be no yeah. benefit like specifically for that question. I guess I yeah. suggest this just as a, as a kind of a warm up problem, right? I mean, I guess the hope is that, you know, if we could do it for that problem, then we could maybe, um, you know, it, it would maybe like reveal some ideas that would be useful for other problems um, where where somehow having the ability to do to do um, divide and conquer directly at the level of, of search problems, you know, maybe could be useful. All right, thank you. Sure. Okay, and finally, Noah. Uh, thanks, Andrew. I mean, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, can I come back to this question about uh, sort of entanglement, or at least I was sure. wondering if thinking about that could help you get uh, some bound um, on the amount of speed up you could get by this method? Because it sort of feels like by the time you've done enough dividing and conquering, you've got very small quantum systems in your hand. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted an exponent, and, and I was wondering if you could simulate, I mean, you might be able to simulate prove you could simulate that efficiently and therefore it, I mean but because each each sub problem is so small mm -hmm. and that might tell you that you can't get an exponential speed up or, or something I mean by this method I just wondered whether I mean, of course the, the subtlety is is the is the sort of the problem and you you also have the problem of building the bits together but I still think if you think about the simulation of some part of your algorithm so certainly by the time you've got a very small sub problem the simulation of those individual components must be easy and so, so you, the, if, the, if you were to get an exponential speed up, it's got to come from somewhere. Um, yeah, I yeah. I mean, that's that's interesting. I mean, I guess, uh, and and maybe something that could play a role, you know, in that kind of analysis, if if one could give it, would be like the extent to which the subproblems overlap, which I guess we were talking about before. I mean, I guess if the you know if it, the more the subproblems can overlap, maybe the more kinds of entanglement you have the possibility of you know the algorithm generating. So like maybe you could prove better bounds or better stronger limitations on sort of like applications of this framework in which you have non-overlapping subproblems than ones in which the subproblems could overlap. I mean, maybe, I don't know. I mean, there, there are, as I mentioned, um, examples of like kind of adversary composition, um, you know, upper bounds that really do show um, super polynomial quantum speed up. So like there's this stuff that Shelby Kimmel did about um, kind of um, kind of particular kind of structured instances of the and or tree problem for which you can you can actually you know have a super polynomial speed up. So I'm not sure how that would sort of like um, you know align, but maybe uh, yeah, yeah I don't know. I mean maybe you, maybe you could prove something like this. I mean it would be interesting. Yeah, just by thinking about the simulation of the pro proposed quantum algorithm, and you, you can't. Uh, I think you, yeah, you might well be able to show that you know, if you if you don't have over overlapping subproblems, uh, you you might only be able to get a certain amount of speed up simply because if you were you to have a have a pro have a quantum algorithm like that, here's a way of simulating it. Right. Uh, yeah, because maybe somehow you could simulate it with only you know polynomial overhead. Yeah. 
that would be nice to show. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, we would like to thank you, Adrian, uh, Ed, Adrian, to uh, to come here and give us a wonderful talk. And for all of you, uh, all of the listeners, please stay tuned for all the uh, new upcoming talks. And uh, thank you all for joining. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thanks day. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity.